the topic of genital autonomy is discussed in all Nordic countries on different levels, in different contexts, but not necessarily so often from a bioethical perspective. We have collected the questions you have entered in advance and handed them over to Brian Earp, who will address them. The stream has a live chat and there might be a chance to address comments from there during uh, the session as well. In addition to that, uh, the discussion may also continue afterwards in the discussion field of the Facebook page mentioned in the live chat. With this introduction, I will be glad to hand over to the bioethicist, the interdisciplinary researcher, Brian Earp. Varsågod, Brian. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for suggesting that we do this. And I saw the questions that were submitted earlier, so I'll start with those. Uh, this is a topic that I've been researching and publishing on for almost a decade. And so I have a tendency to go off into different digressions. And as a way of disciplining myself, I've uh, written down some notes for how I might briefly respond to each of the questions. And I'll start with those. And then I might add some side thoughts and also we'll have time for questions and follow up uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, the first question that uh, I looked at was one that just asked about terminology. And this is an important starting place, I guess, because I'll be referring to various practices throughout this uh, live stream. And so clarifying why I use certain language is probably a good place to start. So this question says, uh, what should the procedure or these procedures be called? Uh, circumcision or genital cutting or genital mutilation? Uh, what is it that decides what term should be used in a given case? Is it the sex of the person that's affected? Is it the specific type of procedure? Is it the cultural context or, or something else? So this is an enormous uh, complicated and very, very politicized question, but I'm going to simplify as much as possible and just tell you what my perspective is. So uh, generally speaking, I think it should be up to each person to decide whether they view their own body as mutilated or disfigured, especially as this can be very bad for a person's body image and self-esteem, and it can affect their ability to have positive sexual relationships. And uh, uh, to take what in somebody's culture or community is considered normal or even aesthetically preferable and suddenly to tell them that their personal anatomy is ugly and damaged and disfigured is something that's certainly not a neutral act it's not merely a scientific description or something like that um, the reason why i say that is that the term mutilation specifically signals a change to the body that the speaker regards as bad and you can see this by considering the example of uh, cosmetic labiaplasty which is trimming of the labia of the, the vulva, which is the common procedure in Western countries. So I'll, I'll start with this just to get our intuitions oriented around a practice that's maybe more culturally familiar. So uh, to use the definition of the World Health Organization, what they refer to as female genital mutilation, they've defined as simply any cutting of healthy female genital tissue that's not medically necessary. That's their definition. So on this definition, labiaplasty, which is done for cosmetic reasons as opposed to a, a strictly physical or functional reason, is technically mutilation, female genital mutilation on their view. Now, the World Health Organization doesn't treat it that way. International human rights law doesn't treat it that way. So immediately you have a sense that there's something a little bit more complicated going on than the typical picture. So why do we not refer to labiaplasty as labial mutilation, even though that's what we should call it if we're, if we're taking the WHO definition seriously? I think we don't do this because most people recognize that the women who, who have this procedure done uh, regard the change as an improvement to their body, even if it's based on problematic norms that cause women to feel uncomfortable with their body as it is, that's, that's very well uh, uh, the case and, and is an important consideration. But nevertheless, all things considered, we accept that from the perspective of the, of the person who chooses this procedure, they regard it as an improvement to their body, not as something that disfigures them. So here, uh, I think we are able to assume that because the woman consents to the procedure. And so the consent here is used as a proxy for a positive attitude. The idea is because she consented, she must see this as a good thing. She must see this as a change that she prefers. 
But I, I think consent is, is really just a proxy here because it's of course possible to see a change to your body that was not chosen as an improvement, especially if you've been culturally conditioned to see the change as normal or common. So you might consider something like infant ear piercing or uh, maybe cosmetic orthodontia, some sort of change to the teeth. Uh, in, in any cultural environment where you make a change to a child's body, it's possible that they may grow up to feel that what happened to them was a diminishment, was something that they don't prefer, in which case I think they have every right to call it a mutilation. But it's possible they may grow up to feel, even as an adaptive preference, that it's something that they like, in which case for me to override their judgment about their own body and say, well, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. This is an undesirable change, to me feels a little bit presumptuous. So. My own view is that these kinds of body alterations from a moral perspective should be chosen. The role of consent is to distinguish between the morally acceptable body alterations and the ones that are morally unacceptable. So that's a question of, of, of right or wrong, but that's a different question from what's the meaning of the words that we're using or what's the political significance of the words that we're using. And so my view is if somebody has a change happen to their body that they regard as good, even if they are just forming an adaptive preference for something they cannot change, I don't feel from my perspective as a bioethicist who's trying to build bridges with people that it's my position to tell them that actually their body is ugly and damaged and bad. So in my own work, I use the term genital cutting and, uh, and, and I let each person decide for themselves how they feel or how they want to describe their own body. So I'll now take a sip of water and then <laughs> move on to the next, uh, the next question. So somebody says, following up on this, is it offensive to those who have undergone the procedure, so any, any form of cutting in this area, uh, to talk about it as genital mutilation, or is it trivializing to those that have been affected negatively if one uses the term uh, circumcision or cutting? This person says, I've heard both men and women who have undergone a genital cutting procedure in their society say that the procedure hasn't negatively affected them, that they live a normal and good life. And even though they weren't part of the decision making uh, because they were children, they still uh, find it offensive to to uh, hear themselves described as mutilated. So this just is to support what I said before. Different people feel, feel very differently. Some people feel that uh, it's important to describe what happened to them as mutilation because that's their appraisal of their body. And it, it, it also shows something about their moral attitude toward the cutting. And I think that people should be free to describe their own bodies however they, they like. Uh, other people feel offended by the terminology. And so again, I use the word cutting because that's neutral and accurate. Everything that I talk about is, is an instance of genital cutting. And uh, and then, it, then it's up to the, the, the person to decide how they feel about it. What my job is to do is to provide moral reasons for why somebody who may well be happy with their body how it is, nevertheless shouldn't repeat the practice on their own child because uh, to my mind, that has everything to do with the matter of consent, with the fact that this is a very private and psychosexually significant part of the body in just about every culture. Uh, and so, so regardless of what we call the act of cutting, my, my arguments have to do with what are the moral reasons for uh, performing or not performing this, uh, this procedure on a child. Okay, so um, the next set of questions are, are really a series of observations or, or claims that people are making about differences between female and male forms of genital cutting. And the, the upshot of many of these different comments is that it's, it's misleading and inaccurate and offensive to suggest that there's any kind of comparison between the sorts of procedures that affect girls and the sorts of procedures that affect boys. I'll also just say that these conversations seem to leave out intersex genital cutting, which is not a trivial issue. Uh, about one in every 2,000 births, it's, we don't have precise statistics, concern a child who's born with genitals that are neither determinately male or female in terms of their, uh, their visual appearance. And so you sometimes have children that have an organ that's either a small penis or a large clitoris. It's, it's both of those things, or it's, it's either of those things. And so actually figuring out whether to classify the tissue as male or female as, as the basis upon which you should decide whether it's permissible to cut the tissue turns out to be very complicated because there's no distinct line. And so, you know, if you decide that the tissue is a penis, then you might think, well, it's okay to circumcise it. But if you decide that it's a clitoris, then you might say, well, you shouldn't cut it uh, at all. So it starts to get a little bit messy, but nevertheless, uh, people tend to think in this very binary way where boys are over here and girls are over here. 
and uh, and these things shouldn't be compared. So just here's here's some comments. One person says, do not equate male circumcision and female genital mutilation. If you're trying to do that, then you're making a cheap polemical point. And what you're really doing is you're doing a huge disservice to the worldwide struggle and fight against uh, FGM. One is a circumcision, the other is a genital mutilation. If you're equating these two things, you're trivializing FGM, and that I cannot believe is anyone's uh, intention. Um, another person says, FGM is a form of violence against women in the context of discrimination. It is important that this violence be discussed in the context of oppression and control of women. Uh, the final comment here, female circumcision must be treated separately. Female genital mutilation is nothing but a serious form of violence against women and girls and a serious violation of human rights. Uh, it's a means of controlling the girl, woman, and her entire sexuality, life, and identity. So um, the upshot of this uh, has been summarized by the host who says, you know, this sort of view is very common in, in Finland. Uh, what is Earp's opinion on this and which arguments are there to, to uh, uh, recommend treating these kinds of procedures either together or separately? So this is indeed a very common view in most w Western countries. Uh, and it has a very particular history in terms of how this way of framing things came to be the dominant perspective. Uh, prior to the 1970s, this wasn't the main view uh, because in uh, every society that practices female genital cutting or mutilation, they also practice male genital cutting, but not vice versa. So there are some societies that just cut the genitals of boys, but there are no societies that just cut the genitals of girls. And in most of those societies, the, the, pr the practices are seen as mirror images of each other or as two sides of the same coin. They often serve uh, comparable social functions. So in, in many African contexts, for example, both practices are done as a rite of passage into adulthood, where boys and girls are equally expected to show courage in the face of pain and discomfort in order to uh, deserve to be considered adults within that society. And so the anthropological view for the longest time was that these were symbolically uh, uh, joined practices. So in the minds of practitioners, they're actually highly related to each other because they're part of a gendered system where, for example, uh, in girls, what's seen as the male part of the female genitalia, so the external clitoris, the part that sticks out like a phallus, by excising this tissue, the masculine androgyny of the child is denied and they're transformed into a fully feminized woman. Whereas for the boy, the foreskin is seen as a feminine appendage that encloses like a womb or a vagina. And so by stripping away the female androgyny of the child, then the boy symbolically is transformed into a, a fully sexually distinctive man. In something similar to the way that in Western cultures, when we have what we regard as an intersex child who we think is insufficiently sexually differentiated, we too uh, perform sometimes extremely invasive surgeries on the children to try to conform their genitals to what we regard as the appropriate uh, differentiation. So anyway, I won't go through the whole story of how we got from the, the prevailing view uh, up to the 1970s, which was that these practices are obviously linked and they remain linked in the minds of most practitioners. Uh, because they came about for shared reasons and they serve similar functions uh, socially. But uh, but I will just tell you a story to give you a concrete sense of why this general framework is unsustainable and why adhering to this framework is very likely to undermine the legal protections that have been put in place so far for girls. So the anti-FGM laws that exist in various countries uh, are at risk of being struck down, as indeed in the United States just last year, the year before, um, our federal FGM law was ruled unconstitutional. And it actually has to do with common stereotypes about what people think FGM is and what they think male circumcision is. Um, so, so one last big picture comment, and then I'll just tell you the story, and, and it, it will illustrate why uh, it's important to get more specific than these broad brushed characterizations. Um, the, the big picture story is that when people think of female genital cutting or mutilation, they almost invariably are thinking of the most extreme forms of such cutting that are concentrated in parts of Northeast Africa. And the, the, the versions that are held up in the Western consciousness through media and uh, activism are forms that are done in rural villages with unsterilized equipment and so forth. Uh, and so they, they take that form of female genital cutting and they compare it with something like perhaps male circumcision as it's done in Judaism or in Islam, uh, 
or as it's done in, in the United States, let's say in a hospital environment. And so when you compare these two things, these are obviously very different from each other. But what most people don't realize, as I alluded to before, is that in that very same African village, if you wanna use that example, I mean, these procedures are also done in hospitals in Egypt, for example, by doctors. But let's just use the stereotype of the rural village and the rusty razor blades. Well, in that same village, the boys are also undergoing circumcision with the same rusty razor blades. And so uh, depending on, on the community, what's done to the boys or to the girls may be more severe or may involve remo removing more tissue and poses a greater or lesser risk of an infection, uh, amputation of the organ, death, and so forth. And so if you wanna make the comparison, the last thing you should be doing is comparing the most extreme form of female genital cutting in a, in a select area of underdeveloped African community with uh, you know, male circumcision as it's performed in a completely different cultural context in, in a clinical environment. What you should do is you should compare the rural form of female genital cutting with the rural form of male genital cutting, in which case the overlaps are ex extremely substantial. Uh, and if you wanna compare medicalized minor genital cutting, you should look to a country like Malaysia where the girls have a, a prick to the clitoral hood performed without removal of tissue. Uh, done usually by a doctor in a clinical context. It may be done with pain control and so on. So that starts to look a little bit more like what's done in the United States. So so in Malaysia, uh, in, in some Muslim communities, both boys and girls are, on their view, circumcised. And in that case, what's done to the girls is less severe than what's done to the boys. So you have to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. But, but let me just tell you the story. So uh, in the United States, we recently had a federal court case concerning the first federal test of our um, anti-FGM law. And it concerned a group of uh, Muslims that are known as the Dawoodi Bora. And this is a religious sect within the Shia branch of Islam. Uh, uh, the Dawoodi Bora are, are mostly based in India and Pakistan, but they have uh, you know, immigrated all over the world and have different communities uh, in, in England, in the United States, and this particular case was happening in Detroit, in Michigan. So uh, the, the form of cutting that was alleged to have happened in this case was what's sometimes called a ritual nick or a prick. So the, the World Health Organization typology of what they call female genital mutilation refers to more than a dozen different practices that have all been conflated under this one term and then the, the most extreme form is the one that people use as the illustration of the entire set of practices. But that's very misleading because in this particular community, uh, it was a physician trained in the United States who's a member of the Dawoodi Bora who allegedly uh, cut or there's some contestation about whether any tissue was removed. But if there was, there, there was no evidence of tissue removal. Uh, 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 girls around the age of seven years old as part of what they regard as a religious requirement. So I'm gonna talk about religious significance and so forth, but the point here is that within this particular community, there's a tradition according to which Muhammad's innovation over the old Abrahamic covenant in Judaism, where only the boys are allowed to be circumcised, is that uh, to, uh, to, to ex extend the central uh, covenant of, of the group to include girls, Girls were also allowed to be circumcised, but it was instructed by Muhammad, and this is recorded in various hadith, which are secondary sources of Islamic jurisprudence, that what should be done to the girls is very minor and should be less severe than what's done to the boys. And so that is in fact the, the current situation among the Dawoodi Bora. It's also true, as I mentioned, among some Muslim groups in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, in, in some other parts of the world that are outside of the African context, which is what most people are thinking about. So. Uh, so this, this case went up before a judge who could very well see that the ritual pricking of the daughters in this community done by a doctor for religious reasons was less severe than the circumcising of sons done within the very same community. Uh, this is a Jewish judge named Bernard Friedman who had previously ruled over some cases to do with defending male circumcision. And it's, it's un, undoubted that he connected the dots and could see that if he ruled that this particular action counted as a, as a federal crime and would lead to you know, more than a decade in prison for, uh, for the members of the Dawoodi Bora, this would have some pretty uncomfortable implications for the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, uh, which says that people, regardless of their sex and gender and their religion, have to be treated equally before the law. 
Now, he didn't uh, rule on the basis of equal protection. He made a very clever argument to avoid that topic altogether. And I'll just briefly summarize what he said. He said that um, this form of ritual nicking of the clitoral hood, which doesn't remove tissue, was already illegal at the level of the individual states because it is a form of criminal assault. So he says, the federal government in the United States, because it has a system whereby the national Congress cannot make laws affecting the individual states unless it's under very specific circumstances, like if the practice affects interstate commerce or something like that. He said the federal government didn't have the authority to pass this nationwide law banning FGM uh, because it covers procedures that are even less severe than male circumcision, uh, but those procedures are are already illegal as criminal assault. So he avoided dealing with the equal protection issue at the federal level, although he, he has language in the ruling suggesting that he was aware of that issue. He's passed the issue down to the states, but kind of boxed things into a corner here because if ritual nicking for explicitly religious reasons constitutes criminal assault, then it's hard to see how a more invasive procedure on boys done but for the same religious reasons within the same group isn't also a criminal assault. So that is now an unresolved issue in American legal jurisprudence. And uh, uh, this is very likely to affect uh, legal interpretations in other countries. In fact, in England in 2015, there was a ruling by Sir James Munby, who is the senior family judge, considering actually a very similar case, a case where what was alleged to have happened was a, was a form of genital mutilation to a girl. Uh, they couldn't find any evidence that any cutting had occurred, which doesn't mean it didn't occur, but it means that if it did occur, it would have been sufficiently superficial that any injury healed completely with no visible sign of change. And he said, this same family, uh, because she has a brother, will undoubtedly have also performed genital cutting on the brother, which will be, on any view, much more invasive than what is alleged to have happened to the sister. And he says, this creates a problem for our law in England because currently we at least act as though the male procedure is tolerable and is permissible. And we don't, we don't only say it's permissible when it's done for religious reasons, by the way. We don't require that there be any particular reason. We just say as long as the parents consent to it or give their permission for it to be done, in England, we treat this as a legal procedure. But an emerging view among some legal theorists is that any cutting of a child's body, if it's not a medically necessary surgery that can't be delayed because they can't consent to it, is, is an assault. That's the definition of assault. So this is where things are now. And what's happening is those who want to defend male circumcision are putting arguments into the literature in bioethics journals, in mainstream law journals to argue that in fact, we should tolerate what they regard as minor forms of female genital mutilation because they, they have put two and two together. They see that if there's a zero to tolerance policy for FGM, including forms that are less severe than male circumcision, and which may indeed be done for explicitly religious reasons, then the next conclusion is that male circumcision would have to be restricted. They don't want that. And then, you know, credit to them for being consistent in their intellectual arguments. They're, they're now actively and robustly arguing in, in the bioethics and legal journals that what we should do is allow what they think of as minor female genital cutting, including something as severe as cutting the labia, labiaplasty, uh, or procedures which remove part of the clitoral foreskin. Now, my own view is that even a little prick to the clitoral hood is a morally impermissible practice because you're concentrating surgical risk on a particular part of the girl's body that is uh, constructed as private and personal in almost any culture and certainly in Western societies. So in Western societies, we have the view and we teach children from a very young age that adults shouldn't even touch their genitals unless it's somebody in a caretaking relationship and it's medically necessary. So if you're changing diapers or something like that. Uh, but if you continue to wash a child's genitals when they were capable of doing that by themselves, everyone would understand that that was impermissible. But of course, any cutting, even, even a nick, is far more severe than, than mere touching. And so in a healthcare context, the doctor certainly should not be taking a surgical instrument to a child's healthy genitals, and certainly not as a way of doing some sort of cultural brokerage with the family. That's not the job of the doctor. The doctor's sole commitment is to the health of the child and has to consider whether the, the patient is able to consent. So this is, this is a, a vast conversation that's happening among experts in this area that the public remains almost entirely ignorant of 
because they're stuck with these stereotypes from the 1970s, where they think what FGM is, is rural villages and rusty razor blades. And what they think male circumcision is, is whatever's done in the US in hospitals, or maybe in a synagogue in Judaism. And they don't think about it very much more than that. They've also been told since the 1970s that these practices have completely incomparable reasons and motives uh, between them, which is not true from an anthrop anthropological perspective, but it's a sort of an article of faith in the Western discourse. And so when people think of comparing what they have imagined in their heads to be completely incomparable practices, it feels very offensive and they, they, uh, they get agitated and they suggest we shouldn't do it. But my argument is, we must compare these practices because they are objectively comparable. And people who know that are making arguments that we should tolerate female circumcision. And so if you want to get ahead of those arguments, which are now gaining steam in the legal literature for the sake of just consistency, which is required by the law, then you're going to have to come up with arguments that are, uh, are, are superior to those arguments. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in my own work, is coming up with an argument saying that all children, regardless of their sexual characteristics and even intersex children uh, who have uh, geni genitals that are that are uh, indeterminate between male and female, all of them deserve to have this special part of their body protected from any surgical risk because it's rational to prefer that no sharp instrument be taken to that part of your body unless you judge that it's worth the risks because you endorse the outcome because you think that on religious or cultural grounds what you're going to benefit uh, from from the procedure is worth the risks.